Okay, so what, where I want to get into now is whether or not it makes sense to use revocable trusts. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of trusts. We've talked, as I said, uh, credit shelter trusts, trust for the children, marital deduction trusts. Uh, let's, let's take a step back as to what exactly a trust is. Now, this isn't the, the perfect analogy uh, if you're a, a true technician, but I think to, to get a sense of the understanding of, uh, of trusts, I analogize them to, to corporations. Okay, a corporation is a fictitious entity. It exists because the law says it does. Trust is similar. Instead, it's its own entity. It can have its own uh, or would have its own tax identification number. Um, instead of officers and directors and shareholders, who are the parties to a trust? You've got who? I mean, I know we know at least two of them. You've got your trustee, who's in charge of it, Benefic the beneficiaries for whose benefit, and who's the third one? The donor. The, the donor referred to normally as a grantor or settler or a trustor. I always call them the grantor. Mm -hmm. That's who sets up the trust. Now, there are two types of trusts. You can have a trust spring into existence upon your death. Uh, an example of that would be, I leave assets to my children until they reach age 35. That trust doesn't exist. Now, you have all the rules spelled out, but it's not funded until uh, you've died, and then it springs into existence, and that's referred to as a testamentary trust. The other type of trust is uh, a living trust or an inter vivos trust. Uh, that's one that's set up and funded while the grantor is still alive. Well, an exam what's an example of that? We talked about one today. The life insurance trust is uh, a living trust because we actually set that up today, we put policies in it today. Now in the living trust world, you're right, there are two types. There's revocable and there's irrevocable. And like the name sounds, revocable are very flexible. You take assets out, you put them in, you change the rules, do whatever you want. Irrevocable, you do the best job you can at the start, but then they're, um, I, I won't say you're absolutely stuck with it, even though it says irrevocable, uh, but it's certainly much more challenging and they're not meant to be changed. Because revocable, there's no tax benefit. In fact, the IRS says, well, that's sort of your alter ego. If you've got a revocable trust, the, the you know, tax ID number is your social security number. So um, on, on a trust like that, uh, there is no tax benefit to doing it. We don't set them up for taxes. What does that mean? Does that mean you know, they're, they're, there's a, a negative side to it? No, they can actually have certain tax benefits built into them, like the credit shelter trust funding. Your will can say, I leave assets to a trust for the benefit of my spouse, or you can have a revocable trust that says, I leave assets for the benefit of my spouse. The point is, you don't need a revocable trust to do credit shelter trust planning. That's not why you do one. A lot of people think, oh, I gotta get a revocable trust to get this planning in there, and that's wrong. Um, they make a lot of sense for a lot of people, but that's not why. Um, and, and the trust for your children, you can do either in a will or in a revocable trust. You don't need a revocable trust for that. So that's not a reason why we set up revocable living trusts. There are some reasons, um, but I, I, when, I, when I'm doing these things, I want my clients to know why I'm doing them. Um, so let's talk about why, why would we want to set up revocable trusts. Well, there's, there are two main benefits to the revocable trust. Um, and uh, the first one is probate. And we'll talk about what probate is and uh, why we have, why it's an advantage. Basically, you use these to avoid probate. The second one relates to disability. So, so let's talk about how that works. If I have a revocable trust, we all understand if I have a will, the will says where all my assets go, uh, at least the ones that aren't passing by way of beneficiary designation or, or title. Uh, if I have a revocable trust, what I do is I put the assets in the trust during my life. If I don't put the assets in my trust during my life, what happens? Does the trust govern it? No, what's probably going to happen is if it's in your own name, your will governs it. And the will then says, move the assets into my trust. So the trust will eventually govern it, but as you'll see, you get no benefit from the probate avoidance because if your will's governing it, you're in probate. And um, you get no disability access to the assets because the only way you do that is if the assets are already in the trust when you become disabled. So let's talk about first uh, benefit being probate. What is probate? Basically, when someone dies, their assets are categorized one of two ways. You have your probate assets and your non-probate assets. Probate assets pass uh, either by operation of law or contract, and we sort of discussed that. Operation of law are the ones titled jointly, tenants by the entirety, someone dies, immediately it is the survivor's asset. 
the ones that pass uh, by contract are things normally with beneficiary designations. You know, a, a life insurance policy. It's a contract with a life insurance company. You don't need any probate orders or order, orders from the court in order to transfer those. You don't have to be the executor. You send in a death certificate and they pay the, de the designated beneficiary. The assets that are, are your probate assets uh, are basically the ones that don't have instructions built into them. So you've got a brokerage account titled solely in your name. Well now, the probate courts make sure that that asset gets distributed in accordance with your, uh, with your will. So your will only governs those probate assets. So I've got this, as we talked about, I've got the fancy trust provisions for my child until age 35 built into my will, and I've designated my, my son as the beneficiary on my life insurance policy. They get, because the will doesn't govern the beneficiary designation governs. So it's very important that you go through not just having their estate documents done, but that you go through every asset title and every beneficiary designation and make sure it dovetails the plan. Whenever I meet with a client, you know, first we start with the, the sort of the inventory of their assets, how they're titled, then we come up with the plan, we draft the documents, and then we sit down and we go through every asset title and every benef beneficiary designation and make sure that those dovetail to the plan. So what's the problem with probate? Why do people care about probate? You know, it, uh, probate uh, has a, a negative connotation associated with it because a lot of people have had bad experiences with it. I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. I think the procedures are better. But there's absolutely going to be more costs associated. Now, it, when someone dies, there are always administrative costs. You have final tax returns, you know, income tax returns, estate tax returns, appraisals, commissions, all sorts of things that you'll have to have even if you weren't in probate at all. So don't think that you will avoid all of your costs associated with death by moving your assets into uh, a trust and avoiding probate. But you will reduce them. Fewer attorney's fees, fewer delays, uh, less time filling out things. So, so there are some advantages there. And if you have, uh, with real estate in particular, you have to probate in every jurisdiction where the real estate's located. So if you have a, uh, a house in Virginia, uh, a beach property in Ocean City, a rental property in Dewey, a timeshare in Florida, oil rights in Texas. And, and don't think you need to have big dollars to have oil rights in Texas. Uh, there are people that have bought small little, you know, it's like stocks. You can buy very small investments. All those things need to be probated in the jurisdictions where they uh, reside, including in some cases uh, assets that are titled jointly. In Virginia, we know that passed by operation of law. There are some states where it doesn't work that way and you have to go through the, the probate even though it's titled, quote, jointly um, <coughs> in those jurisdictions. And, and you have to open up what they call an ancillary probate in all of those states. And that will really start adding to the cost of that. Um, so that's one, one issue. The other issue which uh, is a very legitimate concern and, and I find that um, uh, my clients is, is more persuasive than the, the cost savings is that probate is public record. And there are people that go down to the courthouse and look at the recent probate filings. If you have the ability to keep that information public or private, most people would rather keep that information private. And you can do that, again, using the, uh, uh, with the revocable trust. How does that work? How do we avoid probate? How do you Basically, what you do is you take your probate assets and you convert them to non-probate assets by putting them into the revocable trust during your life. You have to put them in. If you don't put them in, then they're going to go through probate. The will will put it into the trust and your dispository provisions will still apply, but you got to go through probate. If the will's doing anything, you're in probate. So you want to try and avoid, uh, basically you can transform your probate into non-probate. You move them into the trust. The trust now has the rules. They're passing technically by way of contract. Okay, so that's the first big benefit of the revocable living trust.